How you doing here in Miami, Florida? Got my dad doing push-ups and his exercise program in the background. I am bringing you the episode that you and I have been waiting for. I recorded this back when I was in Medellin, Colombia, and this episode is not for you if you don't want your thinking to be challenged. If you don't want the way you're living your life today, whether it's a relationship, whether it's your career, whether it's the way you talk to yourself and you treat yourself, if you don't want those ideas to be challenged, then this is not the podcast for you. I recorded this episode with none other than the most beautiful woman in my life, my sister Tara, and I can say that honestly because we look exactly alike except for I'm the, the masculine version of my sister so uh, definitely the most beautiful woman in my life and just so proud to be able to bring this to you because Tara teaches you through her life right through her example of who she's being as a woman who she's being as an individual who she's being as a person teaches how to let go how to make difficult decisions right about the direction that you're taking your life if you don't like the relationship you're in right now you can choose to let go of it. If you don't like the direction you're taking right now, you can choose to let go of it. And, and she challenges you with who she's being as an individual to ask yourself these really difficult questions and gives you not only the philosophy on how you could do that, and not only the stories and the examples and the anecdotes in her life of how you could do that, but she gives you very tactical, practical, try this, try that advice on how to do that for yourself. So whether it's uh, the career, the relationship, the way you treat yourself, the direction you're taking, if you're not excited about it. I think she's a shining example that you do not need to live your life that way. You can find things that you're excited about. You can fall in love with your life again. So Tara, thank you for being that example for us, for shining your light with the world, for teaching us that we can do hard things if we, as you say, just put ourselves in a position to have a chance. And I could see that you do that for yourself over and over and over again. And I just couldn't be more thrilled to bring this into the world, to share it with y'all. So if you're ready to be challenged, if you're ready to ask yourself some difficult questions about your life, we get into um, Tara's eating disorder. We get into her self-love journey and her relationship with exercise and with food. And I just think it's overall just a a massively inspiring conversation about how to decide whether you're going in the right direction and then to make decisions about what to do about your life from that point. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to tune you into the episode. It'll come up as it comes up, but I just wanted to let you know that you're just reading some of the responses and seeing the growth that you've had um, just made me feel a ton of pride. Oh, and, um, thank you, brother. I love you. Very happy to do this with you. Oh, I'm so excited. So we're going to jump into the show. This is the Circle Up podcast. I have the most beautiful, by far, guest that we've ever had on the show. So we're definitely bringing the, the aesthetic. We're definitely that bringing the, the beauty up. We're bringing the heat up on this show. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's all, it almost, to me, seems like it needs no introduction However, I will introduce you as my sister. When I do some guests on this show where I've never met them before, or like I've had like just very small um, touch points of experience together, it's so easy to do the show because I can just talk about that one thing. But with us, it's like 26 years of my life and almost every step of the way being tied to the hip, like uh, elementary school, Maza de la Rush, moving to Bradford, going to Fred C. Cook together. The only time we ever had any time apart was when you went to grade nine and I was in grade eight. Yeah. And then all of high school. And then you Our went rooms to- rooms were connected by one yeah. wall. Yeah. There was even a point in Bradford where my room was made out of boxes. And my room was on the other side <laughs> of the boxes. <laughs> on the other side of the boxes, like a curtain. Yeah. So and just like- um, I've probably seen more things than I needed to, and you've probably heard and seen way more things than you needed to, but it's just like, where to start is the question. So I will just 
introduce you as um, one of my favorite people in the whole world. And I can say that because we're so similar. And, and so it's just like, it's just lo me loving myself almost. With the man bun, it looks very similar. I like it. Thank you. And, uh, and so just like, I wanted to honor you for who you are in the world before we even start this show and just say how proud I am of the growth and how beautiful of a woman that you're becoming and the inspiration that you are for women all over the world. So that is how I see you. And I wanted to start with, um, what's up? How you doing? Ooh, I'm good. I just finished a morning workout. I got my protein coffee. Nice. What are you drinking? I also have coffee, but I don't want to spill it onto this computer. Don't do that. Um, yeah, so I'm living with Mosin right now in Medellin, and the boys have been firing up coffee every morning, so we're caffeinated and ready to go. I'm pretty sure caffeine just thrives here at the Clark Andrews house. We have Runs multiple different, yeah, multiple different kinds of espresso beans. The machine is always on, so yeah. But That's the I'm machine that, well. that Nana left you? Yes my favorite coffee machine ever i hope it never ever ever dies i hope it has the limited warranty forever um but it makes the best lattes and i just i thrive i thrive every morning i Especially remember my spring cup. i remember um when i was at nana's one time and i thought it was such a like such a joke it's so funny to me they had a repairman come in to look at the espresso machine and he was basically like, there's nothing I could do. I'm sorry. You're gonna have to get a new one. And then just out of curiosity, it was like, is there any way to know like in and around how many coffees have been made on that machine? And he's like, yeah, there's a number dial right here. 40,000 espressos. <laughs> I believe it because I have two to three shots a day. Yeah. So multiply that by how many years she had that machine, which was probably like 10 to 15. Yeah, like a decade. Whoo, that's a lot of espressos. But, you know, us as Italians growing up in the family that we did, um, there was always people at her house at every single time we were over there, family, True. friends. And anytime you go into the home, it's first things first, who wants a coffee? Yeah. So I believe that for sure, for sure. And we're going to get into like kind of that element of like community. And I also want to get into what you talked about um, before we started, which was you had that workout class this morning, the Sunday workout class, your first group class. We're going to get there where I thought I wanted to start was actually with a Apollo Coelho quote. And it's from the book, The Alchemist. And it's basically the premise is talking about decisions and how when you make a decision, you have no idea where it's going to lead you. And when I look at your life and I look at my life, I think about some specific decisions that led us down paths we never would have imagined. Um, so I'll read the quote and then I want to bring up the first one I saw you make, which changed my life forever, which was making a decision is only the beginning of things. When someone makes a decision, he is really diving into a strong current that will carry him to places he had never dreamed of when he first made the decision. And that decision, yeah, Paulo Coelho is, uh, is uh, unbelievable. Um, Ian and I listened to him as we were road tripping across Canada in 2019, and that uh, changed, my, changed my life for sure. Um, that, that decision changed my life. But anyway, the, the one I wanted to tell you, to ask you about is you went to university for biomed, right? It had physics and calculus and all these classes that you and I hated when we were in high school and you went there and you didn't like it. Ooh, no. Oh, I hated it. You know why I hated it though? It was hard work. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. It was hard freaking work. I remember coming home after so I was in Toronto living at Nunez and I didn't stay very late at Ryerson at all. I was there home as quickly as possible. And I remember getting home and <laughs> Nunez was like, okay, I have dinner ready. And I was like, all right, I'm ready to eat. And I eat, I ate so much food. I ate so much food. And then I was like, now I have to study for six hours. Let's go. Jeez. So I went to my room and I was like, I'm about to study for six hours straight. I have a physics test tomorrow. I got this quiz, 100%, no problem. What a pain I didn't ass. study. I, didn't study. <laughs> I was in a food coma. 
and I got to, um, it was like the next morning and it was a blizzard outside and I slid all the way down from where the park is to the yeah, subway entrance about. at, on the hill on my on ass. ass. And I just cried. I was at the bottom of the street. I just cried. I didn't even go to the quiz because oh, no. it was just so hard. And for me, a lot of the times, like with decisions that I was making, if they were difficult and not achievable for me within the first, you know, attempt, I gave up very easily, very easily. So that is something I reflect on daily, truthfully. Uh, my experience at Ryerson, I met some great people. Don't get me wrong. I passed every course. That was great. But it wasn't it wasn't a passion of mine. It wasn't something I was willing to attempt multiple, multiple times to achieve um, what I wanted. And so I didn't want to waste any time and any money. So I decided that it wasn't for me. And that was the first big decision that I made on my own that truly shifted the course of my of my uh, teenage into adult yep. years, really. That whole trajectory. Yeah, it reminds me of um, a couple things. First of all, I did a podcast a couple of months ago with Ian Gabriel's brother, Curtis Gabriel, and he just yeah. talks about like the, the grind of trying to make it to the NHL, the grind of being in the NHL and just how much he had to work for it and how he had to be so specific with his, all his regimens. And he says, if you don't love it, there's no way you'll put in the effort that's required to be world-class, to be professional. And that just reminds me of uh, Steve Jobs, who is the CEO of Apple, who says, yeah, if you do, like, it's to, to change the world, to make a dent in the universe, it's so difficult that if you don't love it, like, there's no, there's no point. And so that's what I wanted to bring up, because the interesting part for me is, and a big lesson for a lot of people here, in my opinion, is where there may have been an expectation that it was, you know, the most important thing was to get a, a good education. Um, but we had parents who, um, you know, I'm so grateful for that never, never really pushed us necessarily to do anything specific, just wanted us to give our best at whatever we were doing. And so when it was difficult and you're, you said to yourself, I'm not willing to put in that much work for something that I'm not really that passionate about. And then the interesting part of this is now where it changed my whole life, which is you decided to do something different. And what was that? What did you decide to do after that? I decided to go to college and it was completely different from anything that I was even thought I would ever I'd do. Consider. But yeah, ever even considered. But for about three years prior to this decision, I'd been working uh, part-time at a swim school uh, for Jessica Langford, somebody that I will oh, always love. And she is one of my biggest mentors um, and paved a beautiful path for me. I, I found this love and art for teaching swimming lessons to kids who are so deserving. Um, and I really honed in on this passion of mine of, you know, working with kids with special needs and um, watching and inspiring children in general, but also adults to get outside their comfort zone and mm -hmm. learn how to swim and uh, create this like beautiful water safety, just outlet for people to explore. And so I was like, okay, this is it, I'm ready. Mom, dad, I'm going to college and I'm going for business entrepreneurship. Jono's coming with me. <laughs> <laughs> and he's sharing half the, half the book tuition and the drive. So I'm ready. That's so fun. Yeah, so I, you decided not going to go to university. It wasn't what I was passionate about. And the, the big takeaway for a lot of people is they're doing things right now that they're not excited about, that they're difficult, they're challenging, they hate it. And I'm not saying everyone is, but there are people who are listening um, who don't like what they're doing. Um, and you don't have to do things you don't like. And so you made a different decision and you said, I'm going to do something I'm, I'm more passionate about. I'm going to learn how to run a business. And the funny part about all that is um, that year you went to Ryerson. I took a year off school. I had no idea what I was going to do. I had just come out of a really deep depression um, uh, off uh, antidepressants and no direction no sense of certainty of where I was going. And literally the day before 
business entrepreneurship course started. Uh, you I went to the school. This day. Yeah, you went to the school to uh, to to get some books or to, to I did do orientation. To do orientation, and and mom and dad were like, "Are you really going to take another year off? Why don't you just go and see what's happening?" And you were encouraging me. Like, Why don't you just check it out? So I, I drove with you. We went out to Georgian College in Barrie. And, and then I was like, so like, what's the situation with this business entrepreneurship course? And I was not sold at all. And they're like, yeah, there's only one spot left. I remember. And then that day you were like, oh, well, you're coming. <laughs> so I might as well just try it. And yeah. I was annoyed because I had worked. I was <laughs> like, I'm ready to do this. I'm paying the money. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I'll just try it. Just give it a go. And you just did so well. Ugh. That was one of the that was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Good. Yeah, and I talk about that a lot. Where um, for 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 men in masculinity, one of the most important things that we work on is being self sufficient. And one of the big challenges with transitioning from high school to university for a lot of students is they haven't had the experience of being self sufficient yet. They were very dependent on their parents and on on the on their resources and on them taking care of them. So they go into university, which is this new environment where now all of a sudden I have a lot of responsibility. I need to take care of myself and having the year off school where I got to live with mom and dad and you, and then the two years of college where we were together every day and driving to school and I still got to live with mom and dad helped me grow up and mature so much where now I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm totally self-sufficient. I'm out here in Columbia um, with my buddies, but never would have been possible if it didn't have that kind of that runway Mm -hmm. where we went to school together and uh you know I had you taking care of me I had mom and dad taking care of me I just wanted to add to that uh in the sense of there was a safety net when we would you know go to school together most of our projects were done together we came home we worked on the same you know the same things together so what we both struggled with um I brought something to the table you brought something to the table and we were able to to blend really well, but let's just say not every day was beautiful. Um, we had many days where I would have left you at the college and drove home, but going through that experience with you allowed me to do hard things and you gave me the ability to keep trying because you were willing to, you know, put in the effort with me and I didn't feel like I was alone with it. So that safety net, that little blanket, and then being able to come home to mom and dad, to home cook meals, to, you know, our laundry being done and things like that, that, that when you do go away to like to university and college, it becomes so overwhelming for some people that that's why that sometimes it, that's why they spiral. And that's why, you know, I wasn't able to, to fully commit to my Ryerson program because I wasn't ready, wasn't ready to do it on my own. So yeah, I'm very grateful for you coming. Yeah. There's supporting a lot of me. <laughs> totally. And, and I thought that my, like, I'm so much in my own reality and what's happening in my life that I forget that my life wasn't the only life that was transforming at that time. You decided I'm not going to go to Ryerson anymore. I'm going to go to this business entrepreneurship program. I'm going to learn how to run a company. I'm going to learn how to grow a business. You started making a business plan. You did, we didn't have a pool in the backyard. There was no hole there. And, and at the same time, while all of this was happening, you were also, if uh, I'm, I'm going to go there, um, you're also having relationship challenges at the yeah, time. Right. And so um, can you talk to me about that element? Because this theme of letting go of something that wasn't working, you were in a program that wasn't working, you weren't passionate about it, you weren't excited about it, but you could have kept going. And a lot of people do. They're in relationships they don't want to be in. They're working work at companies and in jobs they don't want to be in. They live in homes they don't love. Um, and for, for a lot of reasons, right? Some people are in a situation that's a very challenging situation that's difficult to get out of. Um, but, but talk to me about this. So you're in a relationship and it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a difficult uh, part of my, you know, my life. I, while I was at Ryerson, um, put in a, a huge effort with somebody that I'd been with for a very long time, so six years. Um, and I dedicated a lot of energy and money and, you know, emotions to, yeah, and my life to somebody who 
didn't see my fullest potential and didn't didn't push me to want to keep going or to be a better person. So 2016, when I'm opening my first business, the first day doesn't even show up, decides that, you know, this is your dream. This is what you want. I'll support you from behind. I'll be there for your victories, but I don't want anything to do with it. So that was very tough for me. And I pursued this um, a year later, kept trying, kept giving in a lot of effort and finally came to the realization at one point when he looked at me and said that I wasn't worthy of his time, that it was the complete opposite. And that truly shifted my mindset of being very giving and, you know, just like, everybody take everything from me to, hey, this is your turn to be selfish and to grow what you want to grow and, you know, bloom into what you need to bloom into. So I took that, that, that harsh feedback, but I really channeled it in a, in a different way. And, um, I would not be where I am right now today without that relationship and without those challenges and without, you know, growing through those really tough moments because, Whew. Some were some were very difficult, but I'm very grateful that I'm in a different place now. Yeah, and you can't take the adversity and the struggle or any of those things away and still be the same person. So you have to look, uh, you know, I see myself looking at these experiences, making me who I am and not being able to take them out and still be the same. So, you know, obviously you learned a lot and you got a lot from those challenges. The, the big question I have for you around this is um, because... One of the conversations that I talk a lot about with my closest friends is about knowing when, and this is just an analogy, knowing when the juice is no longer worth the squeeze, yeah. right? So the effort you're putting in is no longer worth all of the, the benefits and the things that come from it. So you had this experience and from my perspective, looking at your relationship, even though I was caught up in all the things that was going on, I could see that it wasn't healthy. Mm -hmm. I could see it wasn't working. I could see you weren't being valued and you decided to stay regardless. Eventually it ended. But so I'm, so I'm wondering as this is happening to you, as this is happening to someone, what is it about, what is it about you that made you want to stick around and keep trying versus letting go earlier Obviously, it wouldn't change anything how it happened, but for people that may be in that situation today or might go through a situation like that where they're not happy in, in their current situation, why do we stick around when it's not working? You know, the scary part was is that I was ready to let go multiple times. And I think for some people, and especially a lot of relationships, um, the, the only way to explain this is that you just get so comfortable. You get so comfortable with feeling uncomfortable about the situation, if that makes sense. I, I didn't want six years of time to go mm. to waste mm. and money and effort, all those things. It, it was this overlying umbrella that decided to hang over me, you know, protecting me from what would be outside of that bubble. Yes. Now, if I was there, like looking back now, the multiple times that I was ready to let go, I wasn't ready to let go of, of control for me. I was ready to let go of the person, mm. but I wasn't ready to be alone. I wasn't ready to you know, battle things that I was facing head on. I had somebody there to rebound them with or to argue about other things about. I didn't have to reflect like it's on it. almost a distraction. Exactly. And when you get so comfortable with somebody, especially over a, a long period of time, you start things that they start to do or start to say go unnoticed. Mm. Um, it's not until other people bring them to light that that's not, hey, that's not okay or hey, um, that's not how you talk to somebody or, Hey, that maybe doesn't seem very healthy for you in the long run. Um, 
you tend to just sit in that complacent state. And I personally, looking back, was so complacent with being where I was because I was told many, many times that this is all I deserved and this mm. is all that I, I need. And it's very sad to think about now, but in those moments, you know, I've grown so far from there. And I think a lot of people have experienced that where they're just stuck, 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 and afraid that if they let go of that person or that situation, um, that they're good, there's going to be nothing on the other side for them. And it's the complete opposite. It is the complete opposite. So that, I think that's the, the hardest part of letting go is that, that comfortability being in that state. Yeah. It, it reminds me of a program that I just did with Joe Dispenza. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of him, but he, he has a program online called rewired and he talks about how you actually get addicted to your pain. I, I believe that. I, I do. It's like this familiar past, this certain past. And even though you don't love it, even though it's not working, even though it's challenging and painful, you get addicted to it. And you're not willing to see what you said, which is nothing, the unknown. But the truth is, is that creation, so new possibility, something that could come into your life, receiving only comes out of nothing when there's a blank canvas or there's a blank slate. So what we're, what we're talking about here sounds like letting go of a version of yourself or letting go of your familiar self or your familiar past to be able to open yourself up to something new that you may love and that may be unique and, and something that you actually do deserve because you, you change so much over that time. Mm -hmm. I think just to, to go back on what you were saying there for a second, when we allow ourselves to uh, allow ourselves that you know ability to open our our eyes to what's in front of us and really face things head on, we grow as human beings so much. Like one of my favorite sayings is "keep going to keep growing," and that was something I was afraid of doing. I was afraid of getting out of there. And I was addicted to being in the spot that I was in because that in itself was safe for me. It was safe to be hurt. It was safe to be, you know, comfortable in that place and to do something for myself or to, you know, uh, to start growing up, that was scary. And so it's hard to do those things when they're scary. But I mean, looking back now, bring on all the scary shit. Let's go. I'm totally. ready. Totally. I even remember when, you know, your, your swimming business was like taking off and it was super successful. And at this point you were, you had a new relationship. You're dating John, who's an incredible man. Um, I, I had made the comment about like, wouldn't it be cool if, cause you were like, so into fitness at this point, I was like, wouldn't it be cool if like you ran like a fitness class? And I remember you were like, nah, that's not me. I wouldn't do that. That's so like, and then now it's just so obvious that that's the direction you would take because you step into something new. It doesn't exist until it does exist. Oh, but you planted that seed. Brother. <laughs> you planted it for me. Um, it was it, like, it was already like it, the, 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 it's already there. Like the possibility, the potential is already there. It's just like, will you step into it or not? It's yeah. A big question of this call. Um, so you, you had this relationship and like we talked about, you wouldn't be able to take away that experience to be able to get to where you are. Like it, sometimes you need to know what you don't want to know what's really special. And that's why, you know, some people might disagree with this, but I think for myself personally, spending time with, uh, different women and, and experiencing different relationships and finding out what I don't like and what I do like is actually part of just a, a an exploration of the type of relationship that I want to be in. And if I've only been in one, then how will I know what else there is to offer? If I only have been in one career or one, or one relationship or lived in one place, then how will I know if I, it's really what I want? And so you had that relationship, it wasn't working. Um, you had the courage to let go of it. Um, and this was all when your, you know, your business was taking off. And, and so like these, these decisions, the, the last one that I really wanted to talk about, which was 
you know, you talking about stepping into the gym for the first time. Mm. And this wasn't something new. It was something it, it was like athleticism wasn't new because we, you know, we were swimmers and we did gymnastics when we were younger and we did trampoline when we were younger, but just like going to the gym with the, with the context to improve yourself and to get fit and be healthier was totally new for you. So can you talk about another decision in your life where it was totally uncomfortable? You'd never done it before, but you did it anyway. So how yeah. did that, how did, how did that work? I'm going to go there for a second. Um, when I decided to go to the gym, I had watched you for two years previous get so freaking jacked. And I was so, I was so jealous. I was so jealous inside. I was like, man, this kid can do anything. We literally, you and I, brother, we did the exact same things growing up. We were literally spitting images of each other. But you just always had that one up every time. And I don't know about I that, like, but thank you. <laughs> I was like, I can never go to the gym. This kid's going to just, I'm going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. um, but I went to the gym at January 2016 for the first time for the wrong wrong reasons. Um, Talk to me about that. When I, when I started going to the gym, it was to hopefully help rekindle a part of that relationship that was very difficult. And I said, let's do it together. Let it be something that we want to enjoy and go to together. Uh, it, the gym wasn't for him and that's fine. Um, but I kept going and pursuing it in order to hopefully fix a part of that relationship that I felt needed to be fixed. And that was our health. Um, both of us feeding off of each other and our, you know, using each other's energy source and doing the same thing day in, day out, you know, probably eating out three or four times a week. Yeah. Um, Staying, excessive calories, excessive yeah, drinking. staying downstairs, not doing anything productive. Those were things for me that got very, that that's where I was complacent. I was, I was fine there. Um, especially if he was fine there. So I decided that I was going to go to change my body to hope that it would be enough for him to want to treat me mm. better. Mm. And I think a lot of women uh, struggle with this. They, they really do. I think a lot of women use the gym as a way to physically change their body to hope for something more, or as soon as my body is this, or my weight is this, I will be this for this person, or I will, I will have enough for this person. Um, specifically our partners and the people who are supposed to care about us, no matter what, even if we yeah. are low at our highest weight or our lowest weight or our most unhealthy place. Um, so for me, I started in the gym for the wrong reasons. As that relationship ended, I decided to continue to pursue the gym as a way to find um, a space away from our home where we were with our mom and dad um, mm -hmm. and a space for me to feel safe and to to try difficult things. Uh, I got my first personal trainer in 2017, Emma. She was amazing and literally made me feel like I could do anything. From then on, I progressed and decided to try a few other trainers and I enjoyed every experience that I had um, and learned so many things. Uh, but at the end of the day, the gym became a place for me that I could just go and flourish. And then it became a place that I could go with my dad and dad would come with us to the gym and you and I would go. Um, and then adding walks and things like that, that we got to do as a family was super cool. And then I was like, the next man I meet, our first date will be, or our first or second date will be at the gym. And he'd done good. John and I went to the gym and it was always something I wanted to do. I've always wanted to have that space that felt like mine, but I also got to share with somebody that I really cared about. And the gym became that spot for me. So I hope I answered your question. 
Yeah, there's so many, there's so many lessons and themes in what you're talking about. I think the first thing, well, the last thing that popped in my head, which I'll start with and then I'll retrace, which was um, you attract what you are, right? You attract what you are. And so if you look at, if you look at your first relationship, just as an example of attracting what you are, you got exactly what you asked for. I sure did. You got exactly what you asked for, for bet for better or worse. And yeah. when I look at you in your current relationship, that's uh, healthy and thriving. And he's like a, he's got a successful career and he's yeah. got a beautiful, he loves his family and his family loves him. And it just makes sense that part of your evolution was attracting a man who you are, which is someone that is respected and someone that's inspirational and somebody that loves people. And so I'm very happy for you that you found Thank this relationship. You. So that's the Thank first thing I thought of retracing your step back to I started working out for the wrong reasons as well and it's um, I mean you can see that in where I am today and it's different from where you're at today and I'd like to talk about so for people that maybe are encouraged to go to the gym or who are exercising today and maybe can take it to a different level one of the things I want to talk about is getting a coach and what investing in yourself did for you but just pulling back to this concept of going there for the wrong reasons I was there because of my ego that's why I went. Um, you know, I was coming off of antidepressants at the time, and I, I, I had such a damaged self-image of myself, and and I and I just had the thought, you know, if I just look good, if I just um, if I just get fit and and cut and shredded, then people will like me, then women will like me, and those are the reasons I went, not because I wanted to take care of myself, not because I wanted to show myself appreciation not because I wanted to love myself. And I know that's a lot of the themes that you share today with the women that you coach and, and your philosophy. So I went for all the wrong reasons and that it was just a, it was obvious that I was going in the wrong direction because I injured myself and it wasn't like a, Oh, I, you know, I hurt my shoulder and it would be good in a couple of weeks. It was trauma. And I think I, you know, I attracted what I was, which was, I was, I was broken inside and um, broken if I think of my life in the way Alan Watts describes it, which is my 3D reality and what I experience is actually just a reflection of what's going on in my mind. I was moving towards this point where I was in the gym because of my ego. I'm happy it encouraged you to go eventually. So that's a, that's a win. But, um, but I, I had trauma and I experienced really devastating trauma to the point where I'm still working through this conversation of um, meeting myself where I'm at before I take myself where I want to go, doing it for the right reasons, taking care of myself, loving myself, um, and not being able to do any of the things that I want to do physically today, like go to the gym with you and work out with you and work out with dad. Like dad's fucking 79 this week and he's a badass and he's benching hundreds of pounds and he's squatting still. And I like wouldn't be able to do, I can't do a push up because of the, the, the position I put myself in. So I'm thinking about how is it a reflection of what's going on in my mind? And until I fix that, then my external reality won't match what's yeah. going on inside. Um, so you started for the wrong reasons, but it got you there. Mm -hmm. And now you had, in, you invested in yourself. So talk to me about, talk to me about that. What was it like to put money where your mouth was? Because that's a big block for a lot of people and not just in the fitness world, but in anything, whatever skill you want to develop. I would say that that was probably my second biggest purchase, um, which is probably should have been my first, but mm. um, I, my truck was my first one. But the biggest investment I ever made in myself was giving myself a chance, um, a chance to, to try something that I knew I wanted really deep down inside, but never had the courage to do. I walked into my first training session with Emma and I, I remember it very, very specifically. I looked at her and I was like, so I don't want to do anything that makes me jiggle or I have to get my heart rate really high where I sweat. And she looked at me and was like, I think you're in the wrong place. And from that moment, the first day making me uncomfortable, getting me sweaty, like my heart was 
pounding through my chest. I could barely walk 10 stairs from our basement to our kitchen before jumping into personal training. And I How much did you weigh at the time? Two, 220 pounds. And it was a terrifying experience for me because I had never put myself in a place to be so uncomfortable. Mm. I didn't enjoy wearing gym clothes. I didn't like running shoes. Socks and sandals were my thing. And I, I never, ever, ever saw that what the end result could be because I was so like, I was just so tunnel vision on, I can't do this. This is too much. But as soon as I put money down and was like, okay, I'm going to give this my best shot. I decided to go all out because I was spending very hard earned money. Um, and and if this wasn't going to work, nothing was. And if I wasn't going to put the time and effort into it, it wasn't going to be worth it. And I wanted it to be worth it. And I think that's where the biggest decision was. Like at that point, I just started a business hmm. and I, you know, 2017 going into my second summer, um, hiring my first employee, holy moly. And then she's just dropping money on a trainer. People were looking at me like, who is this girl? Why does she think she gets to do all these things? But I just decided that priority for me was my health and priority for me was being selfish since I had been so giving and unselfish yeah. for so long. So as soon as I made that investment, it was game over. If you could go back and change that decision um, and not get that first personal training, um, you know, you must have spent thousands of dollars. Would yeah. you have, would you have changed your decision? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, I had, after Emma, I had three other personal trainers. Like this was something wow. I dedicated time to. Wow. Um, and, and all I wanted was knowledge. I could go to the gym and do mm -hmm. all these things. Like I could absolutely do those things, no problem. But I needed to invest in somebody who cared about me as much as they cared about the dollar value. Mm. So I'm going in, I'm paying $50 for the session. You better give me your time and attention for that $50 because I deserve it because I'm here. I'm your client. And every single one of my trainers made me feel that way. And, and I grew so much as a person learning from them, but then also to be able to now be like, Whoa, I get to take all of that knowledge and information that they gave me and give it to my clients is just unbelievable. So I wouldn't yeah. change for the world. It reminds me of this concept. Uh, Mohsen and I were talking about this yesterday. He was talking about like how you really can't connect the dots in the present. You can only connect them in retrospect, which is how could you possibly ask clients to pay you for personal training if you didn't go through it first and to realize how much value it really had. It's not just about the training, it's about their expertise, it's about their care, it's about their accountability, it's about how much they give to you. And so I'm really happy that you went through that experience because Jim Rohn, who has been one of my greatest mentors through his lectures on YouTube and through his books, um, you know, he always said, if you want to have more, then you got to become more. And one of the quickest ways to shortcut your becoming more is to pay somebody that has the thing as you want and the knowledge you want and the life that you want to teach you how to shortcut. Cause of course you can go to the gym, like you're saying, but they're going to get you their way faster. And there's almost an element of like skin in the game. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, if I can just touch on that quickly, like if I wasn't, if I made a commitment to go to that training session, I was getting there no matter what because I was paying to mm -hmm. be there. But as soon as, you know, I was on my off day and I was like, mm, maybe I'll go, maybe I won't go. You have to dig really deep to find why, why mm. it is so important for you to just continue even when there isn't skin in the game. So 
on Sunday mornings, we have a 9.30 a.m. class that is no skin in the game. You don't have to pay a single thing. I create the workout. We do it together. You sweat. You have, I have to do show up. You just got to show up. That is the hardest freaking part for people. True. It is the hardest part. And I have some people mm. say to me, oh, I wish I could be there. But, you know, it's Sunday morning. Like, our Sunday mornings are quiet. I'm like, I'm up at 6 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And the reason why I'm up at 6 a.m. on Sunday mornings is because I'm so passionate, so passionate about giving my time to people who deserve it because they're going to be there on Sunday morning. So I go crush my workout before I go and give them their workout because I deserve it too. I deserve my time that feels good for me. And I have fur babies that are up really early and need to be walked. So, <laughs> but it's so important to, to decide, you know, whether or not it's enough for you, if there's no skin in the game or if there is. And for me, it's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. Yeah. I mean, I just thinking about, um, the first thing I thought of is that this is not a one interview, one podcast conversation. I'd love to do many, many, many more of these if you're open to that. Oh yeah, let's sure. go. Sounds good to me because there's just so many, so many directions to take it and the shared experience that we have. Like I know there's so many things we're not going to be able to talk about on the show. That's really the, the hardest part is choosing what not to talk about. And because, <laughs> um, you know, you, you've just changed my life in so many ways and we've had so much fun together. But um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about your business as an example. Like once they dug the hole in the backyard and they put tens of thousands of dollars into doing this, now you're at the point where it's like, okay, well, I better run a successful company now. Like I better actually show up. I better actually get innovative and get creative and make it work no matter what. Be persistent through all of the challenges because, I mean, so this is the direction I'm going to take it. And as you started running a really successful business, and then the whole world experienced a shakeup, never would have predicted the, the pandemic. And you have the type of business where you're face-to-face -face and interacting with people. It's not like an internet company. It's not like doing a podcast where we don't have to be in person. You literally are teaching young people how to swim. So you have multiple instructors. There's a bunch of people in the pool at the same time, and you needed to persist through that and find a way through that. Um, and the reason I brought up the, the, the pandemic was not to talk about the company. I'm, I'm super proud of you for, for kicking ass and taking names and for running a super successful business. Um, regardless of, despite the pandemic, how many students did you run through the swim school successfully with no COVID cases last year? No case, uh, I would say 350 to 400 kids. 350 to 400 kids. And you did everything. Now, I need to preface this that would not have been doable without my staff and my partner like and mom and dad and the fur babies absolutely all of it the people who support me the, the most encouraged me and it was a scary time but i am so grateful so let's hope for better days ahead <laughs> yeah yeah because i'm just i'm you know i'm reminiscing about that story you told us about your previous partner not even showing up on the first day and then seeing the difference between uh william john who just like who just shows up and and gives a shit and is thinking about ways to make the company better and thinking about ways to support you and thinking about ways to grow and then actually just shows up every single day oh yeah if i can expand on that our first week together i was like okay so i run a swim school I don't know what you're up to this week. I know you're a firefighter, so you have a few days off. Do you want to like come see what we do? And he's like, sure. So uh, John was a, also a swimming instructor back in the day, and uh, mm. he's had his fair share of being in the pool. So I was like, come on by. I would love your help. It was the first day of our final two weeks of the summer, and I was like, hey everyone you're just gonna give your payments to john today and like threw him in nice. so i've never seen a man come out on top so quickly i was like i am going to run my business with this guy for the rest of my life and i knew from that day that he was the person i was going to be with because i've never seen somebody 
show up so quickly for me and give me the dedication and time of day like he did and to see how proud he was and he wasn't even involved made me so proud so the evolution of starting my business fully alone with somebody who didn't care to our second year together running swim school um it's night and day and i oh wouldn't have been able to transition through you know covid last year covid mm -hmm. this year uh without him and his knowledge and his expertise his business background as well okay. as his yeah his just his presence in general um does so much for for us as a swim school and us being always women run like it's been five it was five years before John kind of just showed up in the picture and our swimmers and our families were so welcoming to him and I just don't see a day without him so yeah just to touch on that really briefly because um a lot of men might show up like just getting to know this girl and then all of a sudden she's asking me to help you know with payments on the on this first day of the swimming school and they would run for the hills and, Absolutely. and they should, and they should, if they're not interested in being in a committed relationship. And yeah. if they're not interested in a strong independent woman who has their own thing going on. Um, and I think that's a huge lesson for men because if I showed up in that situation, I would have been like, you know, happy to help today. And then I probably would have bounced um, yeah. because that's not where I'm at in my life. And so for both men and women, it's important for us to recognize what do you want? Because it was clear to me when I met John that he's a guy who's looking for a committed relationship and wants to make this relationship work. And you guys were so compatible. Um, whereas a lot of men aren't in that place where they're looking for something more fun and more casual um, or they're just not even ready to be in a committed relationship. Like part of that process is becoming self-sufficient and so kudos to John for setting himself up with a career and setting himself up with emotional self-sufficiency, setting himself up with um, being healthy and fit and strong and all these things where when, his, when he's thrown into the fire, you know, he's got, he's got no problem. He stands there like the rock and is able to be present with, um, with your personality and with your energy and with all, I'm, I'm sure all the challenges you've thrown his way and he comes out on top, like you said, every single time. Yes. I, I want to touch base on that quickly, just for the men who may be listening to this podcast, but for us women, especially if we're independent and, you know, we've flourished independently, that doesn't mean that we don't want you to be a part of all the things we want you to be a part, whether it's small, big, but we want to you to understand that for us, we can do it with or without you, but we'd rather do it with you. So I was in a place before where I was doing everything alone because I was told that's how I was supposed to do it. I was never given the option to have somebody who wanted to support me in that way. So when he came along and he was ready and I was ready to have that in my life, it was a no brainer. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people are afraid to be straight up right away. And for me, I was not wasting any more time. I'd already done that. I am not giving any more effort to anybody who doesn't deserve it. I've already done that. Love that. And, and so I've said it. I've set my pace. I've said to him right off the bat, this is what I'm looking for. If you're here for it, great. If you're not, it's really nice to meet you. But I don't have that time to dedicate to something that I'm not willing to dedicate time to because I'm running a business. I, want, I have things in my life that I want to do and where I want to go. And so if you're going to show up for me, continue to show up and be there. But if that's not the case, tell me straight up. I don't want to be, I don't want to run around any bushes as long if you don't want to run any around any bushes. Yeah. So for me personally, I was ready. And I think a lot of women are ready, but they're afraid to say that they're ready for this. And this is what they want because they're afraid of what the outcome is going to be because they don't want to hear no. 
And I would have been disappointed if he would have said to me, I'm not ready for this. I would have been disappointed. But, you know, maybe at some point then I, I could reflect back and be like, okay, he wasn't the right person, but I found, you know, certain things about him that I really, really like. So that's what I'm going to look for in my next person. Yes. So I think it's very uncommon these days for people to be straight up, especially because we have to do this kind of over the phone, text messaging, sure. social media. And for me, when I was yeah. ready, I was like, this is what I want. This is the, I have three dogs, two dogs. Are you ready? Like, let's go. <laughs> so being in the same place is very, very, it's very satisfying. But if you're not there, don't be afraid. Just, just tell them because it's so important not to waste your time and not to waste theirs. Yeah, I did a podcast uh, last year before I left for this trip with uh, my buddy Johnny Lowe and we titled it A Jerk's Guide to Honoring Women. And it was, a, it was from, the, it was from the, the men's perspective, which is learning to be honest. And that's what honoring looks like. That's what respecting looks like is sharing my truth. And obviously I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it in the most suave Jonathan Andrews way possible of working on my communication skills and uh, looking you straight in the eye and, and, and telling you what I'm looking for. But if, if, they're, if, they're, if they're looking for a committed relationship and I'm honest with them that what I'm looking for is something fun casual, then we can actually amiably do, uh, move, move in different directions. Right. And, and I'm not wasting their time. They're not wasting my time. I respected them by being honest. And actually they might even tell one of their friends that, Hey, Jonathan's this, this great guy. And you know, you know, I'm not in the place of looking for what he's looking for, but you know, you might be. And my favorite relationships that I've had in the last couple of years are the ones where I just said straight up, Hey, this is what I'm looking for. Um, if that works for you, cool. Cause I like spending time with you. And, uh, and they said, you know what, I'm actually not looking for something very serious either. And that those have been the ones that I've had the most fun with. Those are the ones I felt the best about because I was honest with them. Um, and I'm going to get to a point, I know this, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But uh, where one of, my, one of my mentors, who was the CEO of a company that I worked for, said when he met his second wife, he was in the middle of building a company. And on the very first date, he looked her in the eyes and he said, if you're going to marry me, let's do it. And if not, I'm going to go, I'm going to go find somebody else because at the point where he was in his life was he was looking for a committed partner. He was looking for marriage. He wanted somebody who was going to be with him and help him grow a family. And then they, he got married to that woman. And so it just depends on where you are. And if you know yourself and then can honor your truth, then relationships can flourish. I, I am reflecting back as you say those things on the past year. And I just believe that as soon as I met him, that I knew that I found my person. Um, but it wasn't until, you know, August of last year that I was like, he's committed. He's not going anywhere. This guy is going to go through the all the ups and downs all the ups and downs with me and will at the end of the day not isn't going to judge me for a single one of them and whew, i would not be here right now having this conversation with you if it wasn't for him so ah amazing and there's the the one last thing i want to talk about so i brought up the the pandemic and the swim business to go in the direction of um talking about um one of the things that you picked up over the course of the, the pandemic was baking Ooh, and, and, uh, baking. and, and, and the, the reality that we all lived in, which was we had a lot of time. If you took the time for introspection, it's very easy in that place uh, to have distracted ourselves with drugs and with uh, social media and, to avoid facing the truth, which is, okay, now that I'm alone with myself, what do I actually want? Who am I? What am I going to do? Why am I here? These types of, these types of questions. And I know that that experience really confronted you and it, it all ties back into your journey in the gym. And now you pick up baking 
And so now you're home alone. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about what that experience was like for you? And as we wrap up the show, the major theme that I see you sharing in the world is self-love. And so I'd love to see how, how that plays a part. Can you talk to me about, you know, some of the challenges you went through? Cause I know it was a very difficult time. Yeah. Um, I think it was, a, it's been a very difficult time for all humans in general, just because socializing and, you know, being face to face with people is something that we thrive off of. We, some, some people, you know, are introverts and love being at home, but they even need that once in once a week or once a month interaction to feel fulfilled. And one way that I was finding fulfillment at the beginning of the pandemic was through cooking and baking and being in the kitchen. It's something that I love. Um, so I was recipe testing, doing all these different things, trying to make higher protein, um, healthy recipes, you know, get my family on board. I got to enjoy uh, a bunch of those before I left. So yeah, Thank and you. it was great. I really, really enjoyed it. But it got to a point where I was so controlling of what was being put in front of me food wise, that I couldn't have other people make food for me. And this is where things started to spiral. I was confronted with no gym, nowhere to go. I was stuck at home, just like everybody else, with dogs who needed to be tended to, and a family at that beginning point that didn't understand that they needed to stay home and didn't understand why. So there was a little bit of confliction going on through um, the parenting aspect as my parents were being my parents, but I was trying to parent them slightly to help them understand where, where we were at. And that caused a lot of tension. Um, and so I felt, felt a very out of control in those situations. So to bring control back into my life, I wouldn't allow people to cook for me. I made every single meal for the past 365 days. And I, um, I, I would spiral slightly, you know, I'd have a few good weeks. I would work out following some um, online programs that were being put together through um, different influencers that I was following, but also the different gyms were hosting free stuff. So I was sometimes doing upwards of two to three, three, you know, workouts wow. a day just to keep my time filled. Um, and then the unknown of where my business was going to go that year caused a lot of anxiety for me in something that I've never really been open with and have never really dove into is my anxiousness. And I used to feel anxiety in my body and the way it would come out would be through expressing emotions such as yelling, crying, screaming. Um, and I never had control over those things. So for me, my control issues of being a type A person turned into a uh, slight binge eating at night and I would control what I would eat all through the day. And then John would go on shift and I would eat everything I possibly could see in sight um, behind closed doors, usually in the bathroom or um, downstairs. Um, and I would then just uh, purge. I would throw up uh, multiple times to, to feel that I'm in control of my life and I can figure this out and this is how I'm going to be okay. And I would use food as an emotion um, in a way to distract me from what was going on. So it, it was very paralyzing and it was very hard on my relationship with John, um, as he was the only person who knew what was going on behind closed doors and in front of cameras and in front of my family, I was very, I was able to just kind of shut it off. And, and I think a lot of people are able to do this with a lot of things that happen in their life. Like for you, like if we could just go as an example, you know, through your depression, you could get up some days and go to school and put on this face 
and walk through the halls, go to the classes, get the work that you needed for the week, and then come home and absolutely be a mess for the rest of the week or months. But to your friends or to your family, like not those that were really right in it with you, but you were able to, to put on that front quickly. And I, I created an, a different kind of persona uh, that I could use. Um, and it was very fake. It was something that was overcompensating for, you know, lack of nutrients at, at that point, I guess. But I ran through the whole summer um, behind closed doors, throwing up on every single one of my breaks, um, crying profusely. It was a very scary time for me. And so to regain control of my life, um, John either, he decided that he was either going to talk to my mom and dad about it, or I was going to, I was going to face it head on and I was going to figure out a way to get into recovery. So I did multiple online courses. I did lots of forums. I spoke to lots of therapists online, trying to find ways to cope. And I am so grateful he gave me the opportunity to let myself recover the way I needed to recover instead of people trying to force me into recovery because I needed to understand that the overexercising was an issue. I needed to understand that purging and binge eating was an issue. I needed to understand why I was doing it. I needed to get a grasp on what reasons were causing me to go to that place and what are ways that I can combat this. And um, very grateful that he stuck through me, stuck through it with me for the whole time, the whole time. Um, but there are days where, where I still struggle. And, uh, I think a lot of women go through something like this, as, but it's very much so behind closed doors. And, and I feel like a lot of men also go through things like this. Um, body comparison and, and body image is such a broad topic that we could talk about for hours, but social media plays such a direct role in your daily life that it is very hard not to try to find validation through these influencers and through people who are literally working out six to seven times a day to have the bodies that they're having and you know, eating no food, things like that, that I, now that I've gone through what I've gone through, would never preach to any of my clients. And I'm, I'm very open with my clients about where I was with my eating disorder because um, I think that it resonates a lot with a lot of the women, but they're afraid to talk about it. Um, and I'm very proud that I made it through that whole thing without crying. <laughs> but I don't know what direction you want me to go with this, but from where I was to where I am now, I, at my lowest point, had lost my period. I was very sick mentally and physically. And now, um, from that point, gaining over 15 pounds to 20 pounds of weight, a lot of it muscle, which I'm very, very happy about, but to be at a healthier place that I could survive and thrive and give to other people what I want to give to the world, that is where I wanted to be. And the past year was very eye-opening for me, sitting in my own thoughts um, and having to, to hear myself say some of the horrible things I said about me that are so not true. Um, it's been a huge ride, but I am very grateful to be where I am now. Yeah, I wanna just acknowledge you for your strength. Thank you. Thank you for, for figuring it out and not giving up. A lot of people don't have the opportunity to figure it out and are not giving the chance and are afraid to take the chance on themselves um, because they feel so stuck in just like I was in that relationship, complacent and, and 
what I was doing was only fine for me for a certain amount of time until you're now sick and you can't do your daily activities. Yeah. It reminds me of a Warren Buffett quote where he says, the chains of habit are too weak to be felt until they're too strong to be broken. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in this deep rabbit hole doing something that you know you probably shouldn't be doing and isn't making you feel good, but it's all you know. Um, and digging yourself out of it is like a nightmare. Yep. I absolutely but. created a habit around what I was doing. And I wouldn't be able to reflect back on that now if I didn't have the opportunity to to learn through the experience instead of being put down about the experience. Um, he never made me feel like I was unworthy of his time or effort because I felt so little about myself that I needed to do what I was doing to, to feel like I was, I was a part of something because I was so secluded to what I was doing. I was just stuck in the same place for many days thinking about the same things. And um, it is a, a very different view from this side. So uh, anybody who's going through, you know, it doesn't have to be an eating disorder. It doesn't have to be uh, depression or anxiety or things that we, we feel like we can't control, but it could just be, you know, a situation or a relationship or, challenge. you know, a challenge. Uh, allowing yourself the dignity and grace to, to try to work through it instead of just giving up on yourself right away. That's something that I'll take with me and hopefully be able to teach my kids one day. Um, because it, it's always your time to bloom if you want to make it your time to bloom. You can't continue to rise if you're going to let yourself, if you're not going to let yourself fall one or two times, you got you got to push through those really, really uncomfortable moments. So that was one phase of my life and I needed it to be where I am now. Sad that it happened and the way that it happened, but grateful it happened and that I made it to this side. Yeah, there's a lot of themes in, in what we're talking about here. I just wanted to acknowledge you, like I said, for your strength. I also want to acknowledge John for his commitment to you and commitment to the relationship and his patience and his, his love. So I really appreciate you, John, for being there for Tara through all of that. Because like what we talked about earlier was this concept of, you know, putting on a front, like this mask where to the outside world, everything looks cool. You know, you showed up in your business as if there was nothing going on in the bathroom. Yep. As if there was nothing going on behind closed doors. When I showed up at school, like you were saying, those times where I did show up, which wasn't very often, but when I did, um, you know, I had a mask on that it was all good and it was cool. You know, I may, may have been a little less excited like I would have beforehand, but the mask I put on was so that nobody would ask me about anything that I was experiencing or any challenge so I could avoid the whole thing. It's like this deny, deflect, avoid mask that I'm wearing so that it never comes up in conversation. And yeah. What I wanted to ask you is around seeking help mm. because you were very fortunate to have someone so close to you, like John, who is very mature and very patient and loving, who is, who basically said, Hey, you know, what you're doing isn't, isn't cool. You're not respecting yourself. Um, you know, you're digging yourself into a deeper hole every single day when you do this. I love you, but I'm scared for you. Or I love you, but um, and I, I don't want to see you this way. Um, yeah. If somebody, you know, if somebody doesn't have that, like that's, that's, that's really where I'm getting at is like, how do you, cause like mom and dad didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know until I read the fucking form. Yeah. Until you posted it on Instagram saying you were going to talk about your eating disorder. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. But like, how do we like, cause for, for, for men, what we're trying to do is circle up the whole point of this podcast is to give men a space to be able to come and take their mask off. And the way you do that is by building a masculine relationship, AKA you trust the man. It's yeah. a confidential space. If you don't trust someone, you probably shouldn't tell them that information. 
If it's yeah. not confidential, you probably shouldn't talk about it. So this podcast isn't a confidential space, right? You're gonna. This is something you've come to the point where now finally you're ha you're happy to be able to share. You're you're through the majority of the mud, and now that you're on the other side, hey, this is what I learned. Hey, I don't want you to go through the same things that I did. That's why I started speaking up about my mental health and the experience I had when I was in high school. So when you're in that place, is really the the nitty gritty of this conversation is how the fuck do you have the courage and find it in yourself to be able to say, Hey, you know, I need help. I, I remember specifically one day where I was, we were sitting on the couch after a very long day and I were putting in 12 hour days outside to, you know, help our staff through what we were, we were going through. Um, I remember looking at him in literally just being kind of like skin and bones. Um, and him looking at me being like, we won't make it to the other side if this, if this continues. And I said, I know. And from that moment on, as soon as I was confronted with this impact of emotion of like, I'm gonna lose everything because of what I'm doing to myself, um, I was ready to reach out for help now. For the first six months of that, seven months, there would have been no way I want, I wanted to, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want any communication. I didn't want anyone to know. I didn't want to reach out to anybody for help who have already gone through it because I created a habit and it was fine. I was fine. When I looked at myself and was like, I can't do this anymore to me because it's going to hurt other people. Mm. That's when I decided that I wanted to get help. Um, when it started affecting his daily, daily activities, that was really hard for me. I could see him struggling and I didn't want to be the reason why he was struggling. Now for people who are alone, just know that the people closest to you know, no matter what. They know that something is off. It doesn't matter if they don't know exactly what it is, but there's something off. And when there's something off and they reach out and they wanna help, give them the, the time, maybe to, if you trust them, to, to let them listen because they may be able to offer some really great advice or they may not be, but at least you are able to put it on the table that would be my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice is go to people who have already been through what you've been through. I would reached out to multiple of the influencers that I follow who had talked on their platform about eating disorders. And, and they've never spoken to me before and I've never spoken to them. I've just watched their content and, and they, they took the time to give me resources of places that I could go. They didn't share with me, you know, their life story, but they said, Hey, these are some things that I've used or that I've gone to. And I, and I, and I was able to look at those. The third piece of advice that got me off the ground was podcasts. I, I literally listened to a podcast every single morning getting ready for swim school. And it was on self-love. Mm. Like, it had nothing to do with eating disorders. It had nothing to do with body image. It had nothing to do with fitness or um, swim school or anything. It was just purely on happiness and self-love because I, that was what I was missing. I was missing two things that I was faking. I was faking it every single day and it was taking more energy out of me to fake than to actually just let it beam into my life. Um, so I had a few really go-to podcasts. I honestly listened to the same happiness podcast, probably three or four times a week, this same exact one. Um, I can send you the link after, uh, because What's the name of it? it's called the happiness podcast. Um, but it's just, it was just things that got me distracted from what I was thinking about on a daily basis was, mm. is my body small enough? Am I, mm. am I going to be able to fit in that swimsuit? People are going to be staring at me all day. Do I have like cellulite? Do I have lines? Am, 
can you see my rolls through this? These thoughts were just consuming me, consuming me on a daily basis because I had nothing else to think about. I literally had nothing else to think about. We were stuck at home. We, they told us not to do anything. So all I did was dig at myself and judging for yourself. absolutely no reason. Um, so those would be my three pieces of advice. Now, if you're not ready to reach out for help, take a deep breath and then just click send. Because whether it's through an email or through a forum or through an online, you know, or if it's just to somebody like yourself who's, you know, been in it before and you've done multiple podcasts on it, just click send because you don't know what the outcome will be. You don't know where you will be. And I watched multiple training sessions on ways to, you know, battle what I was battling from people who have been there and done that. And it, it made it seem real. It made it seem like I could find what they have now. So that part is, is where I would be if you don't have that person or somebody to rely on that you don't trust fully. Next, find a community. Yeah. Find a damn community that you can create yourself or has already been created that you can jump into and go all out. Yeah. And don't look back. Yeah. Like you've created this beautiful community of men who you guys all give each other the time of day, the trust, the confidence, and that confidential um, space, safe space to be there, you know, an emotional you know, one with their feelings, human being that the world doesn't, you know, the world needs more of. We need more of those men to just show up daily um, and not be afraid to, you know, to be a human. Because women love when we are one with our feelings. We, we love that. If, you know, if John couldn't communicate with me how he was feeling about the situation that I was personally in, I would never have known that he was hurting so deep down, but he, you know, he trusted me. He found a safe space in you guys. That was right through the time that I was going through this. And like, without that, uh, you know, it would have been so much harder on both of us. So I found a few commun communities that I really, really loved and, you know, dove into. Uh, and I still talk to a lot of them today. So and now yeah. I'm creating my own community. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It's like being poured into enough to where you have a full cup and then you can pour into others. And, you know, that I want to just touch on what you described around the circle up community and having men being more in touch with their emotion. We're not saying, I'm not saying, we're not saying be emotional. We're saying understand yourself, know thyself, be able to tap into what am I actually feeling rather so than just when being this. You need to be emotional in that situation you can you can do that you can you can go there when it's needed or when you feel like you need to do that i think we forget that we're allowed to to have those emotions yeah and the most important yeah the most important part of that safe space you were talking about is you're you're living in a reality where all day long you're just ruminating in your own head about these thoughts, the same thoughts every single day. And the disaster of the, the consciousness, the human consciousness is that we become what we think about most often. So if you're thinking about judging yourself, if you're thinking about all the things wrong with you, then you just become more of those things, which is why Joe Dispenza talks about most people spend their entire lives thinking about what they don't want versus what they do want. So when you went into this place where I'm now listening to the same podcast over and over, that's just about self-love and what you do want, you can actually begin the process of taking steps towards that direction of what you do want, which I think is beautiful. And now you're in community. And for men, why Circle Up's so beautiful and why what you described, having this, this you know, having John as a partner and as someone you trusted to be able to bounce off the ideas of you, one of the things you said is, you know, I cut off all communication. I didn't want to talk about it. The reason why that's so dangerous is because if you're only in your head, then it becomes 
my favorite analogy is from Alan Watts, who describes, um, imagine you're in a gymnasium and the speaker brings the microphone too close to the speaker. And that, it, that, that sensation where it starts to reverberate and it gets louder and louder and louder and louder and intense. Yeah. Well, if you don't have an outlet to, to speak what's on your mind, to be able to share and to let it out, then it becomes this anxiety of rumination in your mind where it gets louder and louder and louder. And that's when you can get out of control. Yeah. So the community, the safe space, this trusting relationship lets me, if it, even if it's a vomiting, that's okay. Because now it's not in my head and it's in reality and I can actually look at it objectively and say, wow, is that really how I think? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've also, I, I like the word vomiting in the sense of word vomit for me. Yeah. Change from, you know, binge eating and purging to putting it out on paper and seeing mm. what I was telling myself and how negative it was and changing the narrative. Now, if I can just regress for one second before we wrap this up, recovery is a daily process whatever you're going through grief will always be there you know the eating disorder will always be there but it's just there to remind you where you don't want to go again and that depression you know we all have those days but it's going to be there for those who have you know gone through it as deep as you did it's going to be there but are you going to touch it or are you going to just kind of let it let it simmer and for me you know, I've been now in recovery, I, I would say five months. And there have been days where I, I have regressed and I have gone backwards. And, and that's also scary for people to talk about. Hmm. Because you think, you know, once you're in recovery, you're, everything is fine. Everything is not fine. You lose control, you lose your ability sometimes to see the outcome that you want to see. But it is so beautiful how quickly you can snap out of it and snap back to reality when at one point reality seemed so far away so i want people to understand that yes you are allowed to be in recovery and yes you are allowed to make mistakes and go backward yeah, it's not linear it will continue to be up and down just like your weight like people put so much emphasis on this number. It's going to change every single day. And whether you're okay with that or not, you're going to have to live with it. So learn to live with it and learn to, you know, make it out on the other side with grace and give yourself that, you know, that time to just kind of be okay with it not being perfect at all times. Yeah, what the fuck's perfection anyway? Uh, I got one last question for you before we ask the last question, um, which is, tell me what does self-love mean to you now? Self-love to me, it is a couple of things. I would say my morning routine, my night routine, and everything else mm. that comes in between. So Self-love for me in the morning is hitting five things that will absolutely make or break my day. Non-negotiables. Absolutely. Every single day. My morning coffee, my love with my dogs, I need my snuggles, um, my journaling, and my devotional. So spending a little bit of time with tapping into, you know, something that I've never done before. Yeah, like just finding, it doesn't have to be God, it doesn't have to be whatever mm -hmm. it is, but just kind of getting outside of my comfort zone. So I do that while I stretch. Mm -hmm. Five to 10 minutes. Makes me uncomfortable, but gets my day going. Then the things that will happen in between, I need to let go of control. For me, my type A personality is very dominating. So I find self-love in letting the day roll with the punches a little bit. I Got let it. go a little bit of control. So when I'm at the end of the day and I'm like, wow, I did really well with pivoting off of that. That wouldn't have been, you know, on my regular schedule yeah. that I hourly every single day. Um, 
that self love to me, mm. reflecting on that positive moment that may have made me uncomfortable a year ago. Um, self love is is also you know projecting what I see on on myself onto other people. So you know what I give to the world, and that would be my time. Yeah, I, I teach two classes a day. Um, on some days and then I have personal clients that I, I teach so for me if I'm not filling my cup during the day I can't give them what I what I want to give them so self-love reflects truly back on how I treat myself so fueling wow. myself with good food awesome. and good and good you know books and uh, podcasts things that I really enjoy and my walk non-negotiable for me i walk the dogs three to five kilometers a day it is so important for me to get outside even in the rain even in the snowstorm it creates such a bond for me and the dogs in just nature in general and clears my mind so much so those are some non-negotiables for me and they just create such a beautiful self-love <sighs> It's like it's like this vortex, like this energy. Yeah, like I just feel like it's coming off of me right now. I don't even know I if you can through the screen. No, but. I hear you. And, and lastly, would be my night routine. Uh, you know, putting the dogs to bed and then reflecting on my day is very important to me. Crossing off not the negatives that happen during the day, but the positive things. Like I was saying before, you know, pivoting Focusing on what you want. To to go into the you know the next day with with good intentions and not every Gratitude. day. Yeah. Not every day is going to be great. I, I mean, some days you wake up on the wrong side of the bed, no matter what. And it's very hard to shake. It's hard to mm. get out of, but as soon as you give yourself grace to be human, mm. that's okay. It's, it's, it's a self love journey forever. Yeah. That's, that is a uh, very well said. And the biggest piece that I want to, uh, uh, prop up and emphasize is this idea of the bookends, which is an idea I learned from Darren Hardy a long time ago, who's a, who was the editor of success magazine. And he wrote the book compound effect, which he talked about how the most important thing for him is to control how his more, how his day starts now his day ends because everything in the middle is basically chaos and you just don't know what's going to come your way. But if you anchor yourself, like you're saying in the morning with this routine, this ritual, whatever fills you up most, and then, let it all happen how it's going to happen. And then as you wind down, you have the same anchoring experience that allows you to settle into the evening. I remember we were on the phone a couple, maybe it was last week and you and John were like on your couch. It was on these like two reclining chairs, all relaxed. And you had like tea and some candles in the background and the dogs were hovering around you. So just beautiful way to end the day. Um, so thanks for helping us reflect on that for ourselves, taking the time to fill ourselves up. I didn't realize how goddamn busy you were. So I should probably let you go here, get back <laughs> to your day. The only other thing I wanted to ask you about is about um, who is Laura Andrews to you? Because today is an important day. Today is Mother's Ooh. Day. Today and, is Mother's Day. And I know you're a mother of three beautiful dog so happy mother's day to you Thank but you. Uh, someone that we've shared in our lives is obviously one of the most important people i'm just wondering you know what's something that you what's something you admire in her and and that you try to embody and then we'll we'll go ahead and wrap it up till next time i think um our mom has been the most devoted human being to us since we were born in the sense of she has been a stay at home mom since you know, I, I came out of the womb. So for, for us watching her be all the people at all times, like the best mom, the best friend, the, you know, just like that giver, she's always been such a giver has really inspired me truly to want to give back to the world and the people that are in it that deserve it. Um, but I think the thing that I admire the most of, about her is her resilience uh, yes. and to face challenges head on. She comes in like a firing bullet and she does not waver. And if she is wrong, she is right, no matter what, anytime. <laughs> and I believe at the end of the day, 
that is her best quality because she doesn't give up on you. She, she watches you. She'll let you grow. Oh, she'll argue to wit's end with you, but she'll never give up on you. Mm. And that's something that is sat really heavy on my heart, especially when I was going through one of my darkest moments. I couldn't let her in for that because I didn't want her to see me giving up on me. Woo! So her resilience and her strength is something I admire to the end of this day. And she encourages me every single day. And I, I wanted to reflect back quickly on something she told me this morning was just that she's just so grateful for her kids. And I'm like, no, no, we're so grateful for you because without you, we wouldn't be the people we are. And, you know, we wouldn't have the lives that we have. Um, and the ability to connect with the people the way we, we can because of you. So, yeah, I, I can go on for hours about that woman, but I love her to death. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> and just... she gave me you. She gave me you, which I'm grateful for. So. Yeah, I know. And, and it's like you can't take it. You can't take one side of the equation out without the other. It's like you need order for there to be chaos. You need chaos for there to be order. And with the whole point is like we wouldn't be who we are without her, but she also wouldn't be who she is without us. And so you could just see how it's that beautiful marriage that arrives mutually. And I would echo my biggest admiration of mom is her resilience by far. When you were born and I was born, she was diagnosed with lupus and it's an autoimmune disorder that impacts her immune system. So she has a, she has very little, if any immune system. And so she takes all sort of drugs and things of that nature to help her to, to cope with that. And um, I never hear her complain. I never hear her, uh, I never hear her pity herself or say, why me? It's just, like you said, just a devotion and a, and a generosity and a giving despite all of the pain I'm sure she's going through and all of the challenges that she goes through. And uh, just like, thank you for, for embodying that so that I can look at myself and say, hey, I'm going through a lot of hardship right now with my physical body. And uh, if mom can see the bright side and mom can get through it and mom can find a way to dig her out of the dirt, then I can do the same. Yeah. And just to go on that, um, mom's ability for movement, you know, my movement is completely different than hers. Uh, I, you know, I weight train and, and I resistance train as well as do hit workouts every single day. But well, her good. and I have this, you know, this goal of movement for her is walking as well as mm. dancing. So something wow. we love to do is just dance together. And I am a, I would say I'm not a pro, but um, especially when you start going, uh, but she <clears throat> just tries her best to move and something that has brought me so much self love and so much like joy is just movement in general. And so to be able to share that with her in whatever way she can do it for her brings us, you know, closer together daily. And I would just suggest to anybody, if even if you can't move the way you want to move, just move, like just either get up, sit in your chair, whatever you need to do, put some good music on and just dance around and bring yourself joy because her and I, there's some days where I can see that she's she's struggling and so just some good moving like good music and movement like just creates ripple effects so as long as she sticks to the dancing and not the singing leave the singing to you then we're all good you know what as soon as Celine Dion comes on that woman is a whole nother person and I oh, just man. but I love her so much yeah Thank no we we so adore much. you we love you Thank love you, you. everything we got and I think uh, this is the perfect way to wrap up this episode. Lots to talk about. I mean, you're a successful business person. You have a, a loving relationship. You are an insp inspiration to women all over the world. And so we will definitely have you back on the show. I really appreciate you being here. I love you very much. I love you. Thank you for having me and what you're doing with 
you know, the Circle Up project as well as for men, but also in this case, now that you're just starting this little pivot into the lives of women, I think it's very, very important uh, to remember how much you've impacted me, but also all the individuals that you've had on the podcast and those in your programs. The dedication to improvement and, you know, just your education on everything that you do, you just go full on and you inspire me so much and I'm so proud of you. So please keep doing what you're doing because it's just amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye brother. Until next time. Okay, as my sister so eloquently put it, woo! <laughs> multiple times throughout that episode. Thanks for tuning in to the Circle Up podcast. Until next time, check out the book. The book inspired by the Circle Up community. Man, you know I got you. Teaching men and the world how to change the way and revolutionize the way that they think, act, and feel about their mental health. From I, I need to struggle alone and go through the burdens and challenges of my life alone and man up to... Everybody has mental health. And you don't need to man up. You can circle up. You can come together in community. You can be there for your brothers. Your brothers can be there for you. And so if you're interested in supporting the movement for empowered masculinity, for men's mental health, check out the book at manyouknowigotyou.com. It's a perfect gift for a man in your life to show them and be a symbol to them that you have their back no matter what, that they're not alone no matter what, that you care about them no matter what. And so I encourage you to check it out at manyouknowigotyou.com. Be part of changing the way that men are thinking and feeling and acting on their mental health. Um, and uh, it, makes a, it makes a big difference out here to get that philosophy in the hands of our men. So I encourage you to pick up a copy as a gift for yourself and a gift to a man you love. Perfect for uh, Christmas time and, and, the, and, the, and the new year. So I love y'all. Thanks for tuning in. If you're interested in being part of a men's circle, you can hit us up at circleupmen.ca. Register for the next guest event, which is December 15th, open night. You can see what it's like to be in a masculine environment. You can see what it's like to be challenged on the way you're living your life, the beliefs you have living your life. And uh, I encourage you to, like I said, be part of the way we change the, the way that men think about their mental health. Um, and it starts with you.